From Chicago, welcome to Three Degrees Discussions. I'm your host, Mike Vasquez. This is a podcast devoted to the stories behind the innovators, entrepreneurs, and leaders in the 3D printing industry. I've been kind of building the company up for two years, and it was just heavily like commercially driven because I didn't have any money. Like, um, this isn't one of those stories where, you know, hey, I built my business from scratch. Also, my parents are rich. <laughs> like, you know, this is all kind of like scrapped all of the cash together, small projects, slowly, organically building yeah. the business. You know, we weren't really significant numbers of people in that business until like 2018. So that was Surat Babu. Surat is an expert in combining material science and design when it comes to additive manufacturing. We actually met back in the 2010s while we were both in the UK and while he was working on his company Betatype. He's got great insights and perspectives on the industry and where it is going. Before we get started, head over to www.3degreescompany.com and subscribe to the podcast. Remember, you can listen to the show anywhere you download your podcast, including Spotify, Apple, Amazon, or Stitcher. Also, if you or your company are looking for materials, qualification, or general added manufacturing support, reach out to the team through our website or via email at info at 3degreescompany.com. All right. Hello, sir. Good to see you again after uh, a number of years. So um, I'm yeah, excited to, to start the conversation. And, and like like I do with everyone that has come on, um, I'd love to start from the beginning. So where were you born? Kind of what, what were some of those early days like um, and kind of forming where you are today? Sure. Uh, thanks for inviting me over, Mike. I you know, really appreciate the opportunity to talk. Um, so and also just to catch up but um yeah so if we're starting right from the beginning i guess uh you know i was born in india born in kerala um but came to the uk at a very young age um less than one um and then spent most of my life there um uh you know up until about nine months ago i guess <laughs> did you so, have fam- did you have family in the in the in the uk no we, no we didn't so my immediate family is based in the uk um you know my my parents and my brother and sister but um no we didn't have any other family there so you know uh, uh this was in, this was also you know we moved over there in the mid 80s so um just a very different time you know culturally as well um very much kind of immigrant experience um predominantly you know usually the, like we moved around a lot when i was younger as well so you know one of the only kind of immigrants in in the local area usually or at school um, especially during um, during my younger years, um, a lot changed by the time we, you know where I was in high school equivalent in the nineties. Um, but yeah, you know, I, I, you know that that was very much part of the experience. But um, a lot of that changed when I went to university, moved to London, um, you know, and then and was kind of exposed to a much more diverse crowd and, and range of cultures. Um, and so you know, it's been one of the reasons I think it's always been one of my favorite places and, and it was kind of difficult to leave. Um, it's one of the things that you, you take for granted after you spend a lot of time in that kind of space and environment. Um, but yeah, um, it's, uh, you know, onwards and upwards, new things. Yeah. So, <laughs> And what were you, as you were finishing, I guess, the equivalent of, of high school in, in the U.S. and kind of thinking about university, did you have a particular interest or were you looking at specific universities you wanted to go to or specific courses that you wanted to study was there anything kind of lighting your fire from that perspective well you know as the son of you know of of immigrant parents like you know and indian parents in particular you know my course was very much charted (laughs) (laughs) i got lucky because i was first born so like my parents my dad i remember my dad telling me you know hey you don't have to be a doctor we've got two more one of them will be a doctor but you get a free reign but if you're not going to be a doctor, probably be an engineer. So you know. um, our next door neighbor was actually the professor of electrical engineering at Imperial College. And um, I ended up um, doing, you know, like up until like just before high school, that's when like education became a big thing. I was spending a lot of time studying. Like I, I've always thought of myself as someone who's comparatively quite stupid, but works hard. So, um, you know, that was, so the mentality was always to kind of work. And I remember before university, like, you know, we spent a lot of time on extracurriculum activities, you know, like doing extra courses, did, a, did some programs with the Royal Academy of Engineering. Um, and I was kind of dead set on electrical engineering, dead set mostly because I, like, I felt like that was the right thing to do. And then I got into university and I remember distinctly going into my first lecture and, um, 
realizing that I'd made a huge mistake. <laughs> <laughs> and so, um, but this was quite an, you know, I think when I look back on like how I got to where I am today, most of the things I reflect upon are, are those moments where I failed. Um, and I think that like, that was actually one of the first ones. It was one of my first experiences because, you know, up until that point, I'd never really failed at anything. So I was just like, okay, I don't like this. I kind of hate it, but I'm going to just work through it and it will be okay. Um, but it wasn't. Uh, and the wheels came off and I actually flunked out first year. Um, and, you know, which isn't a great sign. And in the end, I decided, you know, I like, you know, there were there, I, I would, uh, that, you know, I just needed to change up. Um, by the time, by that time, I didn't really have a chance to, switch out to different universities. Imperial College is a engineering, you know, very engineering sciences related um, university. So in the end, um, I took a shine to materials and switched over and, uh, you know, completed that course uh, with honors, uh, you know, over the next four years. But um, even then, like, you know, I, I really enjoyed materials, especially from an application standpoint. And um, I remember my first, you know, internship was at, at the time, Vistian, which was Ford's product division. This was, this was around 2005, 2006, when Ford kind of split out its product division into a separate business. Um, and I went to go work on um, powertrains and cooling, in particular, car radiators. And um, I remember getting there and my boss was like, we've never had a materials engineer before. We don't even know what they do. Um, and that was kind of my first <laughs> realization of what like, a lot of the materials world was like back then, um, mm. which was, you know, materials isn't like a thing that you kind of do in the actual design phase of a product. It's kind of, a, it kind of comes at the start or end of the process, which is, hey, we're constrained by these manufacturing processes and these materials. So, you know, that's what you've got. Or you go, come at it towards the end and you're like, well, I've already designed it and I just need a material to fit. But it's not a part of the language of the design, right? Um, or it wasn't definitely back then. And, um, and, it was so the only other materials engineer I actually talked to was the guy from Alcoa who we were buying the aluminium from. And he actually was also an Imperial College graduate. Great guy, you know. And as I was chatting with him, I was like, you know, I was like, you know, we were talking about the material selection and what he was supplying in. And I was like, is there any particular reason we went with this grade? He's like, oh, I just have a lot of it <laughs> for sale anyway. <laughs> What's that right fit, you know? So it was just like, it was the experience of like materials being almost quite a weird, guarded space. Um, and I walked out of that experience going, well, hell, you know, this is one, I didn't come to do engineering for this. I want, you know, and I really do believe that materials have a part to play in the vocabulary of designing something. So, um, you know, I was kind of, I didn't really want to go into industry. And instead I applied to do a kind of follow-up master's program um, at the Royal College of Art, which was a dual program with, with Imperial College London. So that was a two year industrial design masters. And that really, um, that was an incredible experience. Uh, it really blew the wheels off. Um, it was a, it was kind of like a, it was a mixed program, which really kind of mixed up a lot of mechanical engineering, like, you know, classical engineering teams with industrial designers and, and it, like the philosophy behind that program was very much a kind of psychological deconstruction of like the mentality that that um, engineers typically bring to a problem space, um, and what happens when that problem space becomes complex or wicked um, and, and and really difficult to solve. Um, and it was really interesting. Like a lot of people just fell apart at the at the seams <laughs> when faced with those types of like challenges. I think one of you know one of the first early you know one of the first early design programs. Uh, projects that you kind of did on the course was to design a chair and it's really interesting watching you know engineers design a chair because uh the only way that they can contextualize that problem is is in the is in the is in the kind of objective kind of target of actually making a chair that's really good to sit on right um but that's a really inherently complex problem because the you know the number of different like people have all kinds of different shapes and sizes like where are the compromises um, and suddenly you're kind of like, you know, and then what are the right materials? Like, you know, there's a lot of biomechanics going involved and you can see those people trying to dig into a problem space, which is almost like so large to solve. And then you come up with always this kind of suboptimal solution. And that's the kind of key of design, right? It's like, um, it's, you never make the best solution. You just make good solutions. 
And for a lot of people, that becomes really, really hard because you're so used to the problem being so well contextualized that um, there is a right solution. You know, in in engineering, there's typically a, like a there is an optimal solution, and in design, there isn't. Um, and so, you know, I think that helped a lot with kind of understanding, um, opening my mind up in terms of um, product and like what it means um, to kind of navigate that kind of space. So, was the was the materials course big at Imperial? Were there a lot of people in the in the course? So you know, materials is really like you know. You know, when you, you know, the, one of the things about being a materials engineer is like whenever someone meets you, they're like, oh, right. So you just basically know about every single type of material. And I'm like, ah, no, that's, that's not what happens at all. So, you know, what happens is like, you know, you're a spe- like you're almost a specialist. And when I was there at the course, we were a we were a school of titanium. Mm-hmm. Like that was 90 percent of the work that we did. Right. Like, you know, most of our professors, you know, we had lots of big programs with Rolls Royce. Nearly everybody on the in the postgrad level was doing like work in titanium going back there now. Um, I don't even know if we have a metals department. It's like all biomaterials, nuclear materials. It's kind of fantastic to watch the the, the entire department reinvent itself in that way. Um, depending on, I mean, if I'm being pessimistic, it depends on obviously where the funding is, right? <laughs> right? <laughs> where's the where's the priority targets coming out from in the you know in Europe Horizon 2020 or the Engineering and Physical Sciences Research Council in the UK? You know, it's all very driven around that um but uh, yeah so i you know like my my kind of background experience in that space was um was it really in the metal side a little bit on the composite side um but yeah uh it was a small course it wasn't very popular it was about 30 students and now it's massive as i understand it like into the hundreds um but uh you know like again like when you think about materials it's it's very young Mm-hmm. conceptually young moving away from meta- like you know the, the kind of world of metallurgy and, and then really thinking about it as, as broadly as materials is what like almost probably as young as industrial design like less than, like more than now about 57 like post world war ii 50 60 70 years maybe you could kind of say materials a bit older older than that but industrial design less than that right so um these are very young fields right yeah. so and very young conceptual fields so i'm really sitting in between the uh you know that kind of core like conceptual world and, and then the made world right like you know the pure the pure forms of chemistry and physics and and then and, and, uh and then the kind of real world of actually bashing things together and, and that's where the kind of materials design world kind of fits in kind of filling in the gap um so it'll be really interesting to see how they evolve um and where they go um you know i think as fields so with your uh, so with your yeah. masters, you're doing kind of the mix of art and engineering. What did you have like a like a seminal like a, like output to that, or was it just coursework? Like, did you have to kind of come up with? Yeah, yeah. yeah. So I mean, that was actually one of my first experiences with additive, and it was also one of the like probably my earliest kind of kind of break-ins into the space and, and why kind of, why then became a kind of career for me. So, um, you know, I was always fascinated with um, the idea of how materials kind of um, how materials could become part of the design language of a product in a way which was much more than a, than one dimensional. Um, you know, it's like a like a single singular characteristic of strength or or surface quality, right? Um, and and you know, the defining factor in a, in design space is always the three dimensional. So, one of the earliest projects I worked on was building out and and developing a what was a a kind of soft elastomer composite, which was reinforced with a with a with a 3D printed preform, you know, this was like 2007, 2008 ish time. So, you know, I'd kind of, uh, I was using, I was experimenting with technology, landed on SLS because it was the only one that could really deliver some kind of half decent material quality at that type of resolution. But yeah, I ended up building up a bunch of different materials and then showcasing the ability to kind of like customize just strain curves, build like shape changing transformations and parts. Um, and, um, that really, and also like the kind of, so like the kind of localization of all of that. So suddenly, you know, material was becoming a three-dimensional thing and it was becoming part of the design vocabulary. So like, if you imagine, you know, you want to build something which flexes that like, you know, that's a macro geometry thing usually, right? But what if you can, you can kind of keep that kind of, that kind of geometry and shape consistent and do it all through the material, like preform design, right? That's where that, that so it became a really a, 
um, really thinking about materials in that three-dimensional way. Um, and that was really like what started pretty much everything. Um, so it was, um, you know, from there, after we graduated, after I graduated, a couple of friends and I started a consultancy together. Um, and I did a lot of work in the medical space um, around taking that kind of soft elastomer reinforced kind of process and working a lot on soft tissue. Um, one of our biggest uh, customers at the time was a research group out of Imperial um, that were developing a medical implant. We did a lot of work on a soft meniscus replacement that, that spun out um, a couple of years later. Um, and I also did my doctorate around that time, kicked off around 2012 and, and then finished up in 2014. Like one of the limitations at the time was really around geometrical modeling, right? This was, uh, this was, you know, two, you know, like 2008, 2009. So, um, some of the tools that we had available were like early versions of NetFab. Um, you know, shout out to Alexander Oster awesome dude um and some just you know some really this was like the really the kind of start of a lot of things there yeah. um you know uh, my um my my my, my kind of um, supervisor was sean Hanna, who um you know had kind of set up like complex matters with see madavi which would then become within so you know this was really an early space really a proto space and um kind of thinking about it from the point of view of like materials modeling while doing a PhD in architecture, because that's where computational geometry was really built, you know? And I think like you can see that across the history of the of the space, like people like Sia, people like Bradley Rothenberg from Interpology, like uh, their heritage is actually from the architectural computational space, not from and not from anywhere else. And, you know, there's a lot to be said about um, how architecture as a field has kind of like really pushed computational geometry into, uh, in a way which has become a big part of other other like disciplines vocabulary we're starting to see a lot of it in, in the kind of mechanical engineering and professional engineering space so it's really interesting a different topic but you know that's that that was that was kind of the space there um so you were know, you doing course, consultancy right. and the phd yeah, at the same yeah. like in parallel at the same yeah. time yeah 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 so i mean so the other side of it was is that when i when, we, when i graduated in like, like 2009 we were still coming off the back end of the recession right and what no one wanted to hire was a materials engineer with two years of industrial design. <laughs> you know, that was like, people were like, it's fascinating, but I have nowhere to put you. You're, you're like, you know, the kinds of things that you want to work on just don't exist. Um, you know, like I wasn't going to become a colors materials finish person in industrial design. I wasn't like a pure materials engineer. And so it was, and so a lot of my career has, you know, up until recently, I basically have never really worked for anyone else. And, and that just became the norm just because that was the kind of headwind that I faced up against. So yeah, like we it. set up a that's, <laughs> that's my path. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> materials, uh, yeah. I can't, materials engineers, I can't get jobs, right? <laughs> <laughs> well, not in, not in the way that we want, right? Yeah, I think yeah, not in the, yeah. the roles that we wanted didn't exist. So we had to kind of make them, but it also kind of created an attitude of self-sustenance, um, which, um, you know, that like, which I think became, there were lots of benefits to that. Um, and there were lots of uh, weaknesses, lots of weaknesses. Right? Um, but yeah, so like around, um, like just before I finished my doctorate, I cut, you know, we kind of folded up the first consultancy. We were doing all kinds of work, right? We would like, it was just a general kind of design and engineering consultancy, but we had nothing particularly unique about us. And it was just difficult to compete in that market space. Um, so once we wound that down and we went our separate ways, that's when I started being a type. Um, and I wanted to really kind of like make something that was uniquely driven by the by the research and work that I had built up in. Um, and, and um, you know, I wanted to go solve the big problems that we had, which was really heavily driven by the computational side um, around, um, you know, how do you design these things? How do you make them? Um, and how do you how do you prove that stuff out? Um, and so that journey started around 2012. And, you know, that, that went on for almost eight years i think um but it was a you know I, it was a it was a you know that, around 2014 was when i think quite a really you know a really interesting time in the am industry generally it was kind of like when autodesk kind of entered into the field and i probably saw one of our big peaks right money was getting splashed around companies were getting acquired um and there was just a huge amount of energy like um like a, a, you know i, I I got uh, invited um, 
by Francis Batonti and um, Andreas Bastian, who was a researcher yeah. at Autodesk, um, to go and talk at Pier 9. Uh, and then I met a lot of people that I know in the industry in that space. You know, it was kind of one of those moments where, you know, it was just a kind of a lot of industry convergence. So, uh, Dwan Scott, um, who was again also part of Fund and then Spark Platform and now is doing, uh, he's got that uh, computation design forum later this year. Um, and Arian Agabi, who, uh, uh, Agabi, I never know how to, how to pronounce his name. I think maybe we should scratch that from the podcast. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, he was at Ember and now at Hollow and a couple of other, and, and a bunch of other people. It was, you know, really interesting. And all this time but, you're you're based in in London, right? Yeah, so I, was, you, I, was I mean, I, in, that's I when I visit. I think around this time is I can think yeah, to visit your yeah, offices, right? Exactly. And so I was watching all of this stuff, but also watching it with just a kind of a gasp because there was just a tremendous amount of money getting thrown around, and I couldn't make sense of it because it was like I couldn't, I couldn't, you know. At that point, we'd been do, I've been kind of building the company up for two years, and it was just heavily like commercially driven because I didn't have any money. Like um, this isn't one of those stories where, you know, Hey, I built my business from scratch. Also my parents are rich. Right. <laughs> like you know, This is all kind of like scrap all of the cash together, small projects, slowly organically building yeah. the business. You know, we weren't really significant numbers of people in that business until like 2018. So that, like we were like one or two people at that time. Um, and it was just, you know, the thing was we were so heavily customer focused and value driven like it was just incredibly difficult to kind of like associate with the numbers that were being talked about and just the general stuff because I just didn't see the size in the market. Like, especially the software play. Like, how many serious people were actually doing anything even vaguely like production related? Like the prototyping side, I understand, right? Like, hmm. selling software into the prototyping space made sense, but the, even then, the grand vision for um, for computational design software and for and for like mass production. Um, I think like a lot of the attitude in that space was was also making sure that um, you know we caught the next wave in the same way for power, power solid when we talk about um, you know design software and that kind of on seismic shifts um, like that seemed to be the the kind of overarching FOMO that existed like no, no one wanted to miss that miss the boat on the additive uh, so it kind of transformed like you know the industry um, of course that didn't quite happen. <laughs> And, um, you know, uh, I know, and, and I've always, and, you know, one of the things that I've always been quite interested in, even then in the early days was the hardware was kind of amazing. And, but a lot of the times, like the software and the thought process behind it, which were just nowhere near there. Uh, and I think we're still playing catch up a lot with um, engineers capability to design in the space and, and the industry's attitude towards like understanding how to build the performance out of processes, right? Uh, but yeah, like I was a bit of a gasp by like just like how much money was kind of getting thrown around, and um, a lot, you know, I had a, there was a lot of pressure as well. A lot of people were like, "Look, you know, people are making money. You should just pivot the business into that space." Uh, but it never made sense to me. Like I couldn't. Um, sure, I could do that, but then I'd be chasing something where um, I just wasn't confident, like that that the industry would be in the right place at the right time. You know, if I changed, like we were building a lot of software and. and um, we've got a lot of software in, um, around kind of like design software all the way to CAM and machine control software. And the, the pressure was always, well, you should sell the software. And it was like, well, I don't have enough, there's not enough people for me to sell the software to do to make even a vaguely sustainable business where I can earn considerably more and I can start to build a bit more of a sustainable model. Uh, and that was the model that we went with. Um, but we constantly kind of questioned ourselves about like whether we should productize um but it never felt right um and you know i think and i think that was um that path i think meant that we retained a lot of control i think we built a lot of stuff which was um really valuable to our customers customers um and did you, you know, have, again, like how yeah. when, as you were doing this i mean you had this incremental growth organic growth mm -hmm. you see the market right you have this like you're you're on the pulse of the market like how did you how were you thinking about your own plan right like were you writing up like business plans where was it less formal than is like i kind of know like i, I kind of feel that I, I need to go this way for the business or like how were how were you kind of shaping your like the point where you decided to put your name on the ranishaw lease like how did get how did it get to that that point where where they're like 
jump off points or like, okay, like enough momentum has been created that it makes sense. I feel as comfortable as I ever be with this uncertainty and, yeah. and kind of move it. Yeah. I, so uh, brutal cash flow. I mean, like, you know, I, I, we knew our business in and out, like, you know, I, I um, we were just laser focused. Like I, you know, we, we were able to kind of like see how we've looked from a nine month perspective. And, 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 um, and we also saw opportunities, you know, bringing a system on board, like would reduce a lot of the kind of the total cycle time down risk that we had, even the single machine. Um, so, you know, it was really calculated, but it wasn't in a way of like, Oh, you know, there's a 10 year plan and that is going right. to land. It was more like a, um, this makes sense for our business. And, and like, you know, I think it potentially is an accelerator and it, you know, it, but um, it was with a lot of careful planning, but you know, anyone who's run their own business at this level will know that like, you know, you, and everyone always kind of goes, Oh, it's so cool that you run your own business. And I'm like, yeah, you know, I've lost a lot of hair because of this business. <laughs> <It's> <laughs> like, the, the, like the, the truth is, it's like, you basically wake up every day sweating bullets on cash flow. Like, how do you yeah. pay your people? How do you look after them? How do you look at, how do you make sure your leases and rents get paid? You know, like, um, and that never goes away. You never take time off. It just, it, and it just sits there and it, and it sits like a weight, like an anchor around your neck. Um, and especially as you start to scale up, it becomes even harder, um, to kind of like continuously generate that. Um, I mean, one of the things that we were really lucky on is like, um, we built, you know, I think we built some unique technology, which enabled us to access different sectors, um, which a lot of people weren't operating in. And um, it meant that we built some real great loyal customers, um, which where we were unique. No one else was really operating in, in those certain sectors and spaces. And, um, and that really that really helped support the business. So like one of the things I'd learned in my previous like space was like, if you're competing with a lot of other people, it's pretty tough. It's like a race to the bomb, right? Like, you know, and you may not have the, um, the kind of either the kind of cash reserves or the kind of like operating, you know, processes in place to really kind of beat other people who might be able to just undercut you and, you know, and kind of um, you know, do as good a job. So like that, like what was really key with me with beta type was to build something which was really unique. Like no one was quite uh, like we felt that we were giving a very unique combination of kind of both product design, develop, you know, design engineering and like that additive, like the full kind of cat to cam kind of process development on that and really delivering end use parts at the end. That was, you know, one of the key things there. Um, Can you talk about any of the customer projects or anything that, that you did at that time? um yeah or a uh, framework really. of like how you would how would you work with a customer right or what, think, what, what were the problems that you were kind of broadly talking yeah about? so i think like probably one of the like so the one i talk about the most is the one i can talk about which was um which wasn't one of our biggest customers but i think is like was is very telling of the process that we went through which was um a program with a brand in london called uniform wares which is a watch brand and we did, and we basically what we did there is we, you know, we co we we developed with them um, a, a component product, part of their product line. We launched that product and we built it and shipped it. Like we actually manufactured that product, you know, and and um, um, it was a short run because they were like a, a relatively small brand, but um, you know, we did we did a watch strap, uh, which ended up getting featured in in Hodinkee and like one of the one of the larger blogs in in that kind of space. Um, and I remember being in Seattle actually and walking into a Nordstrom, uh, and there it was. There was a watch with a with a titanium 3D printed watch strap that we had made in our shoebox garage warehouse in London. And it was just bizarre to see a, you know, a part land in a department store in a high-end department store. Yeah. And so, but I think that really talks to the philosophy. You know, we spent almost two, three years designing that part, literally hundreds of iterations, um, you know. So there was a lot of, it really kind of captured a lot around working with that team to really understand like how we could design something which was just very different from a, from a, in terms of the concept of a metal strap um, that we, um, uh, you know, what a metal strap could be like for a watch. Um, the kind of like mechanical behaviors that we could kind of create but all the way down to like really kind of like how do we make this thing right so we had to obviously like you know we spent a huge amount of time 
optimizing the manufacturing process using our tools. We also like developed on the secondary processing, like to get to kind of get the finish to a level. Um, you know, I, there are things that I would like to, I would love to go back to that project and, and kind of redo with more resources. But, you know, like we were constrained with what we had, you know, <laughs> we had to be very picky about like what kind of secondary processing we were going to do. Cause you know, when you start buying a bunch of stuff in that space, like, you know, I'm stuck with it. <laughs> they're all, uh, I'm, I'm, <laughs> they're all in my lease, right? So like, they're all, all in the operating lease in the company. So, um, yeah. So, you know, I think that, but that, that really was the story. And, and the most important thing was really about, really trying to focus in on the application, right? And the end use. That's always been the industry's kind of, one of the biggest problems the industry faces and still one today, right? Which is like, where, where are the applications? What are they? Um, and I think when you you move as well from a philosophy of a technology, which has been about being able to manufacture anything, right? And really for it to be competitive on an application basis, if you look at it, um, what you, you need the technology to 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 map like to transform and fit to that application, right? You think about all the big ones like Invisalign, Striker, GE, right? All of them have kind of pulled the technology to where they need it to be, um, and and made it fit their application um, in order to deliver. And um, so I find it quite funny when people talk, like you know design machines around generalized purposes and then say, yeah, we can do production with that. And it's like, well. <laughs> Not really. <laughs> you can yeah. you, you kind of do everything half ass, right? Which is also like a lot of the problem with the software side as well. One of the things that we discovered was like, you know, the the like the, the typical. I mean, until like you know, companies like Velo came along, like the typical process for generating toolpathing data was really around the philosophy of being able to build ninety nine percent of parts rather than like successfully rather than building any one of them like really really well. And so um, it's just a very different type of approach. Um, and so kind of reworking that and rethinking that was kind of key to our mantra um, at Big Type. But yeah. Um, so a couple more questions. I mean, um, cool. when, what was it like having your company in London? What was the kind of, I mean, you couldn't have been more than a handful of companies in London that was running Titanium and <laughs> DM less. No, no, I, 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 yeah, yeah, no, no. I think, I think very famously, I think we were the, we were the only commercial entity that did it <laughs> in, in the in, inside of the London region before the, uh, before the fire marshals got a hold of it. <laughs> yeah. Well, this is, it's a very interesting thing because we have a very different model to the U S. So, um, you know, the, the fire marshal thing that you guys have here, which obviously changes on a, on a city by city basis, yeah. you know, is, 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 we had a very different approach. Approach. They were more concerned with the argon gas storage than they were with um, this hour to titanium three printer. But I think that might just be a bit of naivety to what was actually going on. But um, yeah, so um, yeah, I think um, I think one of the you know one of the challenges of the space in terms of London was yeah that like London doesn't typically have a huge amount of hardware. Um, like based companies out there or like manufacturing companies. So like, you know, 3D Print UK, um, digital widgets at the time, um, like were mostly plastic printing bureaus. The only other metal was, uh, was Imperial College, um, London, with we, like, we, you know, we, we built a little site, you know, there was a little site there, um, which was, which was obviously then academically research focused. Um, and, um, so yeah, there was just hardly anyone. Who, I mean, there was definitely no such thing as like a design firm or predominantly a design engineering consultancy that was running systems, right? Like mostly everybody was in, in the prototyping space. Um, so, you know, we were, we were unique, but also, you know, it posed, posed a couple of interesting challenges. The other side of it is that there wasn't a huge amount of additive really happening in the space, right? So but I think we were kind of optimally positioned from a point of view of um, on one end, we could access Europe really easily you know so um with all of the kind of um industry that exists there and, and then you know the u.s wasn't too far either so um you know there was a, there was an opportunity to you know work there but it wasn't like we existed within a big additive space or anything like that what we were doing was relatively unique in that area um but we were but what was what was quite rich in london space was the design in the engineering side, like, you know, there was a lot of that kind of stuff and we had a lot of strong network on that. But I think that was a blessing because I think it kept us really focused. Like the technology was a means to an end rather than being the kind of 
core premise of value. You know, uh, you know, when you go to like trade shows and conferences, you can't help but get the impression that additive is the magic bullet, and everyone can't talk, keep talking about how magical it is, right? Um, and yet, the reality is, is that outside of that bubble, no one cares. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I can give my mother like an injection molded part and an additive part, and she has literally no care about it. And that's the same for most industries. I mean, especially when you're talking about commoditized manufactured plastic and metal parts, like no one, like a, a lot of our design engineering capability doesn't have to be familiar with that. Like they just need to have a drawing with a spec on it. And then it's your job to meet the spec. No one cares if um, you have a process, which sure it's magical, um, you know, in the sense of it like builds parts immediately without the need for a tool. But um, uh, it's not inherently, uh, but that, that's, that doesn't actually matter. No one really cares about that from a part perspective. And the other side of it is, is like, you know, for all of that, the toolless nature of it, like the economics that we've kind of built around it typically don't always compete. Sure. I mean, you don't have to build a tool, but like, you know, with the cost of systems as they are right now and the cost of operating them, um, it's still really difficult to make a business model which actually like, feels anywhere near attractive. You've really got to get the most out of those machines to do that. Um, and, you know, we worked a lot on that, um, especially on the laser powder bed side. Yeah. Well, I really appreciate you sharing kind of your story today. And I know it's just kind of getting started. I guess one one question I always like to kind of wrap up with is um, kind of as you reflect on kind of all that you've done in the space to date and even kind of before additive. Um, do you have a book or kind of a, uh, something that you kind of reflect on that has left you with a lot of, whether it's leadership insight or just advice or something that you'd recommend to, to folks that are kind of following along in, in your path or kind of making their own path forward in the space? Sure. Yeah. So while I was doing my doctorate, I came across two two papers. Uh, well, one's a book, one's an author, and that's Cyril Stanley Smith, um, material scientist. Um, you know, who I think if you go and read some of his older papers, um, so this is a guy in the like forties, fifties, like worked on the Manhattan Project, and um, but if you go and read his his, his later um, thesis is on materials and art it's super interesting like it's a view of like thinking about materials and how they speak to us and, and, and uh, you see the transformation of someone who's very technical but also really understanding the context of where materials come from and, and, and how we engage with them and I find that really um, something that I really missed from like the education around materials like you know I, I think like STEM education today is just very like driven by what you what they think you need in like the analytical side of it but like not to the really the kind of um the broader impact that the work that we do has on on people and, and the humanity around us so i think that like his stuff was massively inspirational to me even though it's like you know papers from 50 years ago but the ideas are so sound and then the other one is probably um i think neil buchanan has a great um paper in design thinking um I think it's Neil Buchanan, um, which is really about um, the concept of um, wicked problems. And so like problems which are um, very difficult to define. And I think that's something that anyone from an engineering background really needs, needs to get a grip on and understand uh, is that um, in your, in, in, you know, in our technical world, like it's very simple, like things are relatively, it's actually relatively trivial in the sense of like, okay, you need to optimize for something, but you know, those are all known quantities. I think, as we try to think about like what applications really matter in, in the, the general space, like understanding a broader range of problems is really important. And I think like, uh, that's a great, that's a great paper. Um, so I can probably dig those up and find those for you at some point. <laughs> Fantastic. Well, thank you so much for joining the show today. I really appreciate you sharing your story and wish you luck on everything that you got going on. All right. Great. Thanks, Mike. <laughs>